Morning, Sparks! I, I don't know what I'm teaching Teddy, you. Teddy! Yeah. yeah. You're leading the service. Not Sparks anymore. Oh! Oh! oh. Morning church! Welcome to church this morning, whether this is your first time with us or whether you've been watching us live for the whole 17 weeks we have been doing it, then welcome. We're going to have a presentation soon by our children's ministry team and then we're going to go into a time of worship and hear a sermon that's going to really be encouraging for us today from Timothy. So let's hand over and see what's happening with the Sparks girls. Over to you girls! <sighs> oh, good morning, Sparks. Hope everybody's all right this morning. So, I'm trying to do this puzzle. I cannot work out where this horse goes. Cannot do it by myself. But do you know what? There's quite a lot of things in life sometimes that we can't do by ourselves. But we've all got mummies, daddies, nannies, grampies, aunties, uncles. We all have grown-ups who live with us, don't we? So when we find something really, really difficult to do, there's always grown-ups to ask. If we ask them nicely, then they'll come and help us. But sometimes it might feel like our mummies and daddies just say, don't do that, don't hit your brother, don't push your sister, say please, say thank you, say sorry. And sometimes that's all we hear. But you know what? The only reason that our mummies and daddies do that is because they love us and they are helping us to learn, to grow up, to be kind and considerate and loving people who are just like Jesus. And that's what our mummies and daddies want for us, to be such lovely grown-ups. And that's why they tell us all these things all the time, because they're trying to help us, they're teaching us. And you know what, when we decide that we're going to follow Jesus, when we decide that we are going to believe in Jesus and we're going to become Christians and we are going to follow Jesus, then we become part of an even bigger family we become part of God's family. And when we're part of God's family, we're also part of the church. And at church, we all have um, church aunties and church uncles and church mummies and church daddies. And the grown-up word for that is spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers but basically they're just our church aunties and uncles. And our church aunties and uncles are also there to help us, to teach us, to help us to learn to be more like Jesus. So all our Sparks leaders, we are all your spiritual mothers. We're your church aunties. And we are all here to help you, to help you learn to read your Bibles, to help you learn to pray, and to help you learn to be just like Jesus. So it's really important to listen to our mummies and our daddies, and also really important to listen to our church aunties and uncles. In the Bible, there's lots of stories where one grown-up has helped another grown-up, and where a grown-up has helped a child, and they've helped them learn how to follow Jesus better. So it's really, really important. So when something's difficult, like trying to put this piece in the puzzle, oh, I've done it, yeah! Then we can ask people for help, can't we? We don't have to learn to follow Jesus by ourselves because sometimes we might find it really difficult to say a prayer. So we just need to ask somebody to help us and then we'll be able to do it. So now we're gonna go and find the other Sparks leaders and see what song we're going to do this week. Let's go. Okay. Oh no! Oh no! Get out of the car! Oh no! Get out of the car! Oh no! 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 O
Oh, oh, guys, guys! Look, 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 look! I got my mask ready for this. Yeah. Let's put them on. Let's put them on. Ah, look at my lovely mask. I wear it as a headband because it makes my hair look good. Keep your chin warm. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, oh, good. Hannah, I wouldn't wear oh. that driving if I was you. Oh, oh. guys, oh. are you serious? What? Yeah. What? 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 That is what? not how you wear masks, people. What? Oh. what do you mean? Oh, I don't like not it on, on your my... head and your chin. Oh. I don't like it on my face. I, oh. I know they're horrible, but you have to wear them. Right? But it's itchy and sore. Oh, I know. Oh, so let's wear them properly, guys, okay? okay. Over your nose and over your chin. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. So from Thursday, we're meant to be wearing these guys, all right? Okay. So if you're yeah. asked by an adult Sparks, you're to wear your mask when you go inside, okay? Make sure it properly. It's going to keep us all safe, all right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Yeah. Well done, guys. Oh. So now we've learned how to wear our masks. Oh. Yeah. Should we do a song? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just Let's happened to bring my guitar. <laughs> Pop that away. Oh. Here we go. Right. What are we going to do? What should we sing, what guys? Should we, sing? should we do? I have decided to follow Jesus. Ooh, yes. 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 Let's Let's do it. Yeah. That one. Here we go. Yeah. Limber up. Come on, guys. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Check out next week for the answer and a new location. Have a great week, guys. Bye. Bye. Well done, Sparks. Awesome, as always, if I do say so myself. Now, before we start with worship this morning, I just wanted to get the announcements done and out the way for you. So this week, we're going to try and continue with house groups as much as possible. We know we can't meet physically, but we can still have six people in a garden at one time. So please, can I encourage you that to see this time as an investment into the family of God and into your own spiritual refreshment, grab up to six people, sit in a garden and do house group together with the other people in your house group. Please do not waste an opportunity to fellowship with God and with others this week. Now, because of the ever constant changing of the government's restrictions and legalisation, we have decided as a church that we are going to leave church alone for the whole of August. We're just going to have the morning services live and house groups during the week. This is because we don't want to confuse everyone and it's August, everyone's tired, and everyone needs a break and to go on holiday and whatever they're doing. So can I encourage you to please tune in to the live services on a Sunday morning is this is going to be our main way going forward for August.
However, we don't believe that you have to miss out on church just because you go on holiday. So we would love to see your pictures of you tuning into church on Sunday morning whilst on a beach, whilst on a hike, whatever it is, wherever you are on holiday, we would love to see your photos of you enjoying church um, whilst away and relaxing with your family. Now, birthdays this week, as Joseph said last week, it is Jane Pools, Dave McGaskill's Elizabeth Ormarks and Alama Day. Happy birthday, guys. We love you and we're sorry we can't celebrate and embarrass you by getting you to stand at the front of church. But we will embarrass everyone who's had a birthday during lockdown when we can all meet back together. That's the notices for this week. And I'm just going to um, read a psalm, one of my favourite psalms, Psalm 103. If you'd like to follow with me in your Bible, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And this is just a reminder today why we are here, why we have taken time out of our weeks, of all the stress, of all the lockdown hassles, because we want to praise God this morning. Psalm 103 says this, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. And in verse 19, he says this, The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we we hear your command from scripture this morning that says praise you with all our hearts. Whatever week we have had this week, whether it has been good, whether it has been awful or whether it's just been mediocre. Lord, we come this morning fresh. We come this morning depending on today's mercies, depending on today's blessings, knowing that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, that you never change. We can come to you as we are, knowing that Jesus Christ, you are ruling from the heavens, that whether our life is out of control, you are still in control. Whether we are waiting for healing, you are still healer. Whether we need mercy and grace, you are still the mercy and the grace giver. We declare this morning that you are a good God and we will worship you in spirit and in truth with our whole heart. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone. My hope is found, He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, I comfort my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Still on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground 
His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious days, up from the grave He rose again. And as He stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His and He is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever. Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand No power of hell No scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand my life by strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground fell through the fiercest drought and storm
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh jesus yours is the victory you to not leave anything behind leave it all at the altar don't leave this time knowing you could have give, given Jesus more of yourself my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name when darkness when darkness seems to hide his face I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the Christ alone And Christ alone Cornerstone In the Savior's love and through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone and Christ alone, cornerstone, we can make strong in the Savior's love. Oh 
blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. He then, He then is all my hope and stay. Righteousness alone, for the stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. storm you are our anchor that it is by your blood and your righteousness alone that we can stand knowing that we are dirty rotten sinners but we are cleansed cleansed by Jesus Christ himself who came to die for us may we never lose the wonder of your grace may we never lose the wonder of your mercy your undeserved mercy May we always declare you are Lord of Lords, no matter our circumstances, no matter our situations, no matter our own feelings and our own deceitful hearts, we will declare with our tongue, with our soul, with our heart and with our mind that you are Lord of all Lords, that you are conqueror of everything, that you are victorious. Whatever's happening in our life, you are good, you are faithful. And we declare this morning those truths over our lives, over our own hearts if needs be, but also over our situation. Whether our situation changes or not, whether we get that healing or not, whether we get that breakthrough or not, you are still faithful and still good. And we just say thank you this morning because your cross is enough. Your cross and your mercy and your grace is all we need. That is more than we deserve anyway. Thank you, Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. We're um, going to go into um, hearing God's word now. And it's Tim this morning. We love Tim. And I just want to pray for him um, as he brings us God's word. 
Lord, we thank you so much for your Bible. We thank you for those that have given their lives over the years, that we may have your words in our hand, that we may have the Bible as the instructions on how we can live and the way in which we get to know you. I pray that you will bless Tim for the time that he has spent searching your words, for the time he has spent listening to your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that what you say through him will penetrate our hearts, that you will take his word and you will split it, that each single one of us can hear from you individually for our own life and circumstance. Please, will you bless him, will you anoint the words that he speaks and will you give us conviction where it's needed, comfort where it's needed and challenge where it is needed. In your name we pray, amen. Over to you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Now, if you happen to come across any happy football fans at the moment, the chances are they are Liverpool fans. Uh, we have a few in our church. Uh, last month, for the first time in 30 years, they won the Premier League title, and that follows on from their big European triumph last summer, although we won't dwell too much on that one, given the team they beat to win that crown. Um, now, central to the success is Jurgen Klopp, the German manager who is also a strong Christian. And what comes across in all comments about Klopp is his man management, his ability to bring out the best in his players. And listen out for the common thread in the following excerpts from interviews with some of their players. Andrew Robson says, we're all kind of brothers and we have a dad figure in the gaffer, that's Klopp. And he's the one that leads us in the right direction. Roberto Firmino says, he is what you see in the public, the passion, the father figure. And Sadio Mane, we all love him like a father and we fear him like one too. He takes up a lot of space in my life and not just in football, he's great as a person. And Liverpool are arguably the best football side in the world at the moment. And at its heart is a man who acts like a father figure to the players. And this has no doubt been a key factor in the team's success. And this morning, I'd like to spend some time looking at, at a relationship in the Bible where we see a similar father-son dynamic going on. Paul, and my namesake, Timothy. And this is a continuation of our Race Runners series and provides the context for our key series verse, which is 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. On a number of occasions in the New Testament, Paul refers to Timothy as his son. 1 Timothy 1, 2, he says, To Timothy, my true son in the faith. And in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, For this reason I am sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. Timothy was a native of Lystra in modern-day Turkey, born to a Greek father and Jewish Christian mother and it is there that he likely became a Christian on Paul's first visit to the area. Indeed Paul had seen Timothy grow up since he, he knew well his mother Eunice, Eunice and uh, grandmother Lois. And it was on Paul's second visit to Lystra that he invited Timothy to join him on his missionary travels. And throughout, throughout Acts and Paul's epistles, Timothy pops up in a whole host of different places, be it joining Paul in places like Athens and Corinth, or left alone to take care of matters in places like Philippi and Thessalonica. And Timothy, interestingly, is recorded as the co-sender uh, of Paul of, of six of Paul's letters. And to gauge the, 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 the esteem in which Paul held Timothy, we need only look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me, served with me in the work of the gospel. At the end of his life, Paul is so t keen for Timothy to join him. Do your best to come to me quickly, he writes in 2 Timothy 4 verse 9. Paul, writing this, is imprisoned in Rome. He's in a cold dungeon. Friends had deserted him. He is lonely, but he wants his true son in the faith, Timothy, to be with him. And it highlights the intensely personal nature of this relationship. And it's an affection that was clearly reciprocal, as, in, as implied in 2 Timothy 1, verse 
4, where Timothy, we're told, shed tears at their separation in Ephesus. And Timothy was in Ephesus when Paul wrote um, 1 Timothy. So what do we know of Timothy's calling and character? Well, Timothy was not an apostle, but he was certainly a leader with what you could say was a missionary calling. This involved evangelism, teaching, dealing with problematic issues in the churches, offering comfort to believers. And I love what Paul says of him in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 2. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. Timothy was a loyal and steadfast man, passionate about the gospel and utterly reliable. And Paul was immensely fond of him. In fact, Timothy means one who honours God. And Timothy was that man. He honoured God. But he was also young and timid, sometimes lacking in confidence and overawed by the level of responsibility sometimes given to him. And we pick this up from the gentle but powerful encouragements that Paul gives to Timothy across these two letters. And this is summed up well in what is perhaps my favourite book, favourite uh, verse of the Bible, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. Amen to that. And what makes the letters to Timothy all the more appealing is that they aren't just an investment in the church matters that Timothy is involved in. For example, in 1 Timothy, in the first Timothy, false teaching was a, was a big issue and there were leadership matters to, to, to resolve. But the letters are also an investment in Timothy personally to build him up in his faith and calling. And this is especially the case with 2 Timothy, which is intensely personal. Paul appears to be lonely. Friends have deserted him. It's the last letter he would write. And so the letter almost serves as a final exhortation to Timothy before Paul's death. And Timothy wasn't the only one whom Paul took under his wing. Take Onesimus, the slave at the heart of Paul's small letter, to Philemon. I then as Paul, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. That's verse 10 of Philemon. And that brings us on to 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, which gets to the heart of what I'd love to communicate with you guys today. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. He's saying that, that you've got lots of teachers, but you don't have many fathers. And it's almost a, a heartfelt cry for more. An article in the Church Times earlier this year by Ruth Perrin highlighted research that reveals that 70% of those under 30 describe themselves as nons, those with no religion. And half of those raised in religious homes reject their family's faith. And only about 3% of those aged 18 to 30 attend church on any given Sunday. The article then goes on to reveal the outcome of interviews with people in that 3%. And four common threads emerged in response to the question posed by Ruth to them, which was, what would you like me to tell church leaders on your behalf? Number one, get real. Number two, talk with us. Number three, something to live for. And number four, a desire for community. And the last is particularly uh, instructive for us today, a desire for community. And Ruth goes on to say this, those whose faith had thrived in their twenties spoke of relationships with older believers rooted in hospitality and generosity. These were not elders who bestowed nuggets of wisdom like largesse, but authentic mutual friendships with believers of other generations who helped them to navigate the turmoil of their twenties. When churches authentically model loving one another across generations, it has a huge impact. And it is my belief that we will see less young people leave the church and perhaps even lose their faith if the church, and I, I speak generically here, had more spiritual mothers and fathers. 
This isn't something only church leaders can do. Sure, leaders must lead the way and set an example and be at the forefront of this. But this is a whole body, church ministry. Mike Pilavachi, founder of Soul Survivor, has spoken at length about this topic. And in a talk he did at Naturally Supernatural a couple of years ago, he said, if we are truly to raise up sons and daughters, the first thing we need to do is we've got to raise up mothers and fathers. Around mothers and, fa around mothers and fathers, people grow up, people develop, people gain confidence. And that's why I began with Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool and the impact that a, a, a figure of this nature can have on people. And what adds weight to Mike's call, to go back to him, is the inspiring example he himself sets. He has been best man at 19 weddings and once the father of the bride. And many of these people are from his youth group. Mike's not married, he doesn't have children, and he has godchildren coming out of his ears. And all of this is a remarkable number. And it's testament to his desire, his willingness to invest in others. So what did Paul do to build up young Timothy? Number one, Paul recalled prophecy. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 19. Number two, Paul believed in Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith and in purity. 1 Timothy Four, verse 12. Number three, Paul urged perseverance and steadfastness in Timothy. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. 1 Timothy 6 verse 11. Number four, Paul instructed and advised Timothy. Keep reminding them of all these things, he says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 14. And that epitomises a lot of the instruction that he gives to Timothy. Number five, Paul told Timothy that he was growing. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Number six, Paul was vulnerable with Timothy. Do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. 1 Timothy 4 verses 9 to 10. He's sharing his heart, his, his loneliness. Number seven, Paul worked with Timothy. Paul wanted to take him, Timothy, along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Acts 16 verse 3. Number 8. Timoth Paul looked out for Timothy. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. For he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 10. See to it that he has nothing to fear whilst he is with you. Number nine, Paul commended Timothy to others. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Philippians 2, 19 to 20. And finally, Paul prayed for Timothy. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day, night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. 2 Timothy 1 verse 3. We all need one or two people in our lives who particularly look out for us, no matter how old we are. We are a family and families look out for one another. And a key, a key way that we as a church can grow as a family is by being a community that has spiritual mothers and fathers. Now, I'm not saying that Paul's relationship to Timothy is one that we should all follow 
to the letter. Clearly much of the nuances to their relationship was linked to the fact that Timothy was an apostle, uh, Paul was an apostle and Timothy was his apostolic representative. But the principle behind their relationship is one that we can all learn from. An older Christian simply looking out for a younger Christian. And this isn't about being an especially paternal person. You may be listening to this and saying, look, I'm not particularly motherly or fatherly or pastoral in that way. And whilst there are certainly those more gifted in these areas, don't underestimate what you as an older Christian with experience, wisdom and testimonies galore can offer to those younger in the faith. Be that in one, two or all of the ways shown uh, in, the, in uh, Paul's relationship to Timothy. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Paul says that in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. And in a similar exhortation in Romans 15 verse 1, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. The older looking out for the younger. At the Bible college I attended, there were people who lived there that had been there the whole lives. They studied at the college and then they almost made a vow of commitment to serve the college for the rest of their lives. And it was great having them around to pick their brains, to pray with, um, to chat with, uh, get glean their wisdom. And a couple of years after I left the college, I went back for a fly and visit and I was catching up with a, an elderly couple, Richard and Christine. And Richard said to me that he prays for me every day. And it totally took me aback. The college has had many students come through their doors and I hadn't even been there for a couple of years. And yet this man quietly, faithfully was praying for me every day. I didn't know him especially well, I didn't have lots of fireside chats with him, but he was just looking out for me with his prayers. And sometimes being a spiritual mother or father is simply committing to praying for someone regularly, be it weekly, bi-weekly or even daily. Now I don't know where this message, how this message finds people. There are people in our church who model this already, often in unseen ways. And the encouragement to you is that what you're doing is so, so important. Please keep going and even consider how you can grow and, and invest further in that ministry. To others, perhaps this is an idea new to you. And if so, is God nudging you to take someone under your wing, to pray for them regularly, to check in on them, to share wisdom and life? to go out for a coffee, to commend to others, to gently but powerfully build up in the faith. Whether you are 18 or 80, look around our church and see if God is wanting to use you in their life as a spiritual mother or father. And maybe you're listening to this, just wanting that relationship for yourself, just someone to look up to, someone to just have your chat with, someone to pray for you. If that's you, then come see us as a, as a leadership um, and, and we'll see what we can, can do on that front. Or perhaps approach someone and just ask if they take on that role. And it perhaps goes without saying in all of these things, but in all these relationships of this nature, appropriateness and safeguarding is absolutely paramount. And what we are doing in this is reflecting God's relationship to us all. In scripture, God is described in both paternal and maternal terms. Romans 7 verse 15 says that you receive the spirit of sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Whilst in Matthew 23 verse 37, Jesus says of the people of Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Psalm 145 verse 4. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. I'll say that again. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. Let's make this 
more and more a tangible reality in the life of our church. And in doing so, model well what shines through in the letters of 1st and 2 Timothy. One older race runner faithfully investing in the life of a younger race runner. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you look out for us, your children, through mothers and fathers. Yes, our biological mothers and fathers, but also spiritual mothers and fathers. And I pray that you would encourage and strengthen and empower all those that just have that role in some way in our church right now. That those relationships would grow and that they would be so significant for, for the lives of young, uh, the younger Christians in our church. But it would also be an encouragement to the mothers and fathers themselves. And if this is something that you're wanting others in our church to step out into, for this to be a new thing that they do, nudge them, Father, speak to them, speak to us, God. And may we see more and more of this dynamic that we see in Paul's relationship with Timothy. One older race runner looking out for a younger race runner. Father, build us up as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tim. What an encouraging word as always. And it's so important um, to make sure that we have spiritual fathers and mothers in our lives. And I want to encourage you, if you're part of our church and you know someone that needs a spiritual mother or father, then please support them, get to know them. If you need a spiritual father or mother in your life, maybe you, you don't come from a Christian background and you need that wisdom and maturity in your life, then please seek us out and we will give you and show you someone who can be that spiritual mother or father for you. And um, I just want to finish with a scripture before we go into our last song. Just to encourage you all, the ser series we are doing at the moment is running the race. And in Philippians 3, 14, it says this, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And as we do this last song, I just want to encourage you to reflect on what Tim has shared with us, um, what Sparks has shared with us, what the worship has been sharing with us. And don't rush this last song. We're going to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We're bringing it all together to Jesus. He is our ultimate and he needs to be our everything. So as we finish this song, can I encourage you just to reflect on Jesus, to pray about becoming a spiritual father or mother, or ask God to bring one into your life this morning. Dear God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the ability to worship in our own homes. We thank you for the internet. We thank you for all that goes on in the background. But Lord, may we finish this service remembering that we are part of a family and that we are here to serve and love one another. But Lord, also that we are here to serve and love you first and foremost. Thank you that you died on the cross for us. And as we end this time in our service, may we always reflect this week on just how wonderful you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When I
did as such love. 